name is JJ Spoon and I'm a Professor of Political Science and Director of the European Studies Center here at Pitt. Welcome to this month's Conversation on Europe, which is part of our Year of Recovering Europe series. Today's topic is COP26 and the European Green Deal, European, Europe's response to climate change. You will have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A function. Feel free to post a question at any time during the discussion, and I will try to get to as many of these as I can. If you feel, uh, if you'd like to post comments, you can use the chat for this. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Study Center, which is part of the University Center of International Studies at Pitt. It is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors are the Georgia Tech Center for European and Transatlantic Studies, the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida, and the Center for European Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. To learn more about our upcoming conversations on Europe, as well as other programming and our Year of Recovering Europe, please visit our website, uh, which one of my colleagues will put in the chat. Here you can also find recordings of past conversations and additional materials. Finally, I would like to thank my colleagues, Iris Matijevich and Kenny Riley for their help with today's event. For two weeks in November, diplomats from almost 200 countries convened in Glasgow, Scotland for the 26th Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, known as COP26. Discussions and negotiations focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, phasing, out, phasing down of coal, and ending deforestation, among other topics, all with the goal of reducing global warming to 1.5 Celsius compared to the Industrial Revolution by 2030. Outside the conference venue, thousands of citizens and activists demonstrated to demand more action on the climate crisis. In Europe, the EU's Green New Deal includes the Climate Target Plan with the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. Among European citizens, a recent Eurobarometer survey found that 93% of Europeans believe that climate change is, a ser is serious. Today, I'm joined by a panel of experts to discuss these issues, both in the context of Europe and locally. First, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Shanti Gamper Rabindran, who is Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research focuses on the empirical evaluation of environmental policies, including reducing risks in the chemical manufacturing sector, the remediation of hazardous waste sites, the environment and health amp impacts of development policies, and the impact of inspections on violations of environmental regulations in the shale gas sector. Her new book, America's Energy Gamble, People, Economy, and Planet, will be released in January 2022 from Cambridge University Press. The book examines the opportunities and barriers for the U.S. to shift from its fossil fuel, fuel dependency to renewable energy, including efforts to combine the energy transition with economic development. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Patrick Beyer, who is Senior Lecturer in International Relations in the School of Government and Public Policy and Chancellor's Fellow in the Center for Energy Policy at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. His research focuses on international cooperation and the political economy of environmental regulation and energy policy. He's particularly interested in how domestic political economy and political incentives shape governments and firms' responses to climate change and the global energy transformation. He is currently studying the politics of carbon markets, firms' commitments to corporate decarbonization, and the distributional effects of climate policy. He also leads a recently awarded ESRC project on the role of science in international climate cooperation. Next, I'm happy to welcome Catherine Reitig, who is Senior Lecturer in International Politics in the School of Geography, Politics, and Sociology at the University of Newcastle in the UK. She is currently visiting researcher at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and in society at the Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich. Her research examines how the effectiveness of climate change governance can be improved. Her particular focus is on the role of learning non-state actors and multi-level governance dynamics between countries and the United Nations, and how these dynamics facilitate policy change for more effective environmental governance. She has participated regularly as an academic observer in the UN FCC negotiations since November 2009, and has conducted various research projects on the UN FCC negotiations focusing on the influence of non-national actors, negotiation strategies, and the role of leadership by governments and non-national actors. Her book, Learning and Governance, Climate Policy Integration in the European Union, was recently published by MIT Press. Last but certainly not least, I am very happy to welcome Rosemary McCartney, who is Senior Fellow in Foreign and Defense Policy at Massey College at the University of Toronto. 
She is also currently serves as the senior advisor to the UN's Foundation's Pandemic Response and Preparedness Project and the independent panel for the Pandemic Preparedness and Response and is a member of the board of the World Refugee and Migration Council. From 2015 to 2019, she served as Canada's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations and the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. She has written, written recently on how refugees and displacement must be a consideration for global governance of climate change. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start us out um, by uh, asking Catherine um, our first question, uh, which is the following. Um, as a regular observer of UN FCC negotiations, um, could you start us off with some impressions of the recent COP26 meetings in, in Glasgow and how this has compared with other COPs that you've observed? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be contributing to the panel. So what we have seen with COP26 in Glasgow is, well, it really depends how you measure success within the climate change negotiations. From an external observer perspective, we're still not anywhere near achieving the 1.5 degree target or even the two degree target. And time is running out and things are looking increasingly dire all around the world. So it is absolutely crucial to keep up the pressure on governments and to really focus on achieving and actually implementing climate change action on the national level. Having said that, um, there's also the kind of internal to the negotiations perspective because it's very important to keep in mind that we're talking about a United Nations process which is based on the consensus principle, which is actually interpreted in a way that gives every country, every of the 190 plus countries, a veto right in the negotiations. And we don't even see that in the United Nations Security Council, where it's difficult enough among the permanent five members to agree on something. So the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC negotiations, have been struggling with achieving meaningful agreements over the past 26 conferences of the parties, the COPs, and considering how difficult it is to achieve such an agreement and the differences among countries' interests in the negotiations, ranging from, for example, Saudi Arabia towards um, other countries which are trying to actually address climate change and are trying to be very progressive on it, and the plight of the developing world who is suffering most of the negative consequences, the interests are very widely spread. So that makes it very difficult to agree on anything really. So keeping that in mind, the progress of COP26 is actually quite impressive. And they have managed, especially with the pandemic conditions, which have made everything even more difficult and just in terms of the logistics of holding the negotiations in the first place, which were postponed, they were supposed to happen last year. And also the interim negotiations, usually two weeks at the headquarters of the UNFCCC in Bonn, have also been either postponed or held online recently. So things have been much more challenging than they were even just before the pandemic. So considering that, they have quite achieved an impressive outcome. You mentioned them in the introduction. And but we're still not anywhere near. So it's really important looking forward towards the next COP27 in Egypt next year, that countries are really stepping up their ambitions, but they're also increasingly starting to look towards implementing what they have already pledged because a pledge isn't worth anything if it's not possible to implement it within the timeline. And this is really where the real work is starting. Comparing with um, this COP to the previous COPs, it's also important to keep in mind that the climate change negotiations are essentially continuous. They happen all over the year, but we have certain focusing events where it actually makes it into yeah, the public sphere and uh, yeah, the public actually notices that something is happening. Also to put pressure on governments, we've seen an impressive turnout of heads of states, heads of government, the negotiations ministers. And this really has helped also to arrive at a number of side deals which are not formally within the UNFCCC, but that are actually very strong signals also to the financial markets around stopping deforestation, uh, reducing methane emissions, phasing down, not phasing out coal, 
but at least there is an increasing recognition that there will be massive stranded uh, assets around fossil fuels in the future. So it has been an important signaling and focusing event, similar to the 2009 climate change negotiations in Copenhagen, which were not able to deliver on that comprehensive global deal that everyone was hoping for at the time. But 2015 in Paris, that was possible. And also the increasing pressure especially from Fridays for Future and all kinds of civil society over the last years that really has helped to push climate change back up on the global agenda. And it's wonderful also to see that the United States is back and starting to contribute as well to the global effort around addressing climate change again. Great. Thank you so much for that, um, that great uh, introduction and overview of, uh, of the COP uh, in, in Glasgow. I want to turn, um, and obviously uh, lots of things that you mentioned to, to return to, I want to um, get to a couple of the, the major issues that were of interest, I think, specifically to, um, to European leaders and, the, uh, and those issues on energy policy and on migration. And I wonder um, if uh, we could, uh, Patrick, if we could turn to you to talk a bit about um, what some of the European leaders were, were uh, what their uh, strategies of negotiation were, what some of the things that they were talking about in, um, as they relate to uh, energy policy and, 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 and some of the things that, uh, that Catherine has mentioned as well. Yes, sure. Uh, great. Uh, well, as of, again, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and I, I greatly cherish the opportunity to uh, to engage in this interesting conversation to uh, this to today. Um, so, well, I think in, in, in terms of strategies or I think in terms of um, European priorities, there certainly is uh, kind of this notion of, of trying to ramp up uh, ambition, which I think has very kind of has been fairly, fairly uh, dear to, to the heart of European uh, leaders and, and also to the European Commission, obviously kind of it, it goes very well with uh, the EU's idea to become the first uh, carbon neutral continent by 2050. And I think in, in, in response to that, um, kind of mid this year, the European Commission put forward this, uh, this, this kind of comprehensive package of legislation or proposal for legislation, which is kind of referred to as this Fit for 55 package. Um, and this is really more or less a uh, uh, an overhaul of a lot of the climate, energy, and, and transport legislation across Europe with the idea to align those policies with this ramp up ambition to uh, achieve this net zero uh, goal by, by 2050. Um, and I think in, in an interim step, more or less up to 2030, which also kind of mirrors the, the, uh, the nationally determined contributions that the European Union uh, submits to the UN process, uh, there has been ramping up or greater focus, especially in, in, in regards to renewables. Um, and there's quite a, quite a step change, I think, in, in, in terms of the ambition uh, when, when it comes to the, the, the buildup of, of renewables kind of going forward. So the, the new goal is to, to increase renewables from about 20% right now to 40% within the next decade. Um, and and this, is, this is really an ambitious commitment in a sense um, that um, at least for Europe, uh, the, the, the European leaders kind of want to, to push forward. Um, but as I said, kind of this, this Fit for 55 package really covers uh, housing emissions, transport emissions, aviation, shipping, um, and then probably we'll come back to, to kind of talking a little bit more about more or less sectoral pledges and the importance of sectors and the importance of, of bringing on board um, corporate activities uh, kind of more, more broadly. Um, but I think uh, the European Commission or the European Union and, and, and the European leaders certainly, I think, try to, um, well, to bring other countries on board uh, and, and, and raise the ambition in this, in this race to net zero by 2050, I think. So I think that, that that's a little bit their, their um, I think, their, their self-perceived role in a sense. There, there are some debates about whether they think they, they achieved that or not, but maybe we can come back to, to that kind of going forward. Um, Great, thank you. Um, I wonder maybe uh, just um, to follow up briefly on some of the um, uh, sort of heterogeneity that we see across different uh, sort of different countries and sort of at, in their individual, um, you know, sort of ideas and policy proposals and things like that. Obviously we talk about the EU and the EU's Fit for 55 program, but we see obviously differences across countries. And I wonder if you could talk, speak to that a little bit um, and some of the different sorts of um, 
proposals, positions, things like that, that we that we may see um, across different countries. Obviously, that's going to be quite um, related to the, you know, the, the governments um, of various countries, things like that. So. Yes, sure, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, so I think there's there's probably two two components or two ways to, to, to look at that, right? I think the one thing, especially when we talk about uh, energy transformation and kind of, again, we're talking about a social transformation that that's probably second to none, uh, maybe only by by kind of similar to, to what we've seen in the Industrial Revolution in a sense. Um, and I think just because of that, certainly there are kind of structural factors that play into positions that, that countries take. And these has ob have obviously to do with, with access to resources, with availability of technologies and, and so forth. Um, but obviously as a political scientist, as someone studying political economy, um, I think there's, there's kind of a lot of differences that come from differences in, in the domestic politics and in kind of uh, kind of how salient particular issues are, how strong particular sectors kind of hold sway over governments. Um, and, and you can see those differences, right? I mean, kind of France has traditionally be strong in nuclear power. So that kind of happens to be a, a, a non-carbon um, uh, energy source. And, and that obviously makes it, makes it easier on, on, on some aspects, right? Germany traditionally has been strong in coal. Um, again, the new kind of incoming German coalition, for instance, has been uh, kind of facing out uh, or kind of brought forward the date by when uh, Germany will, will exit coal, uh, which, which is very much appreciated. But then again, it kind of tells you a lot about the, the political struggles, struggles on the ground when we talk about how do we kind of compensate um, kind of losers from, from these type of policies um, and, and kind of what's the, what's the political sentiment around, around those type of issues. And I think if you start looking into the the, the domestic politics and the, the, the kind of the salience, the political economy of some of those issues, um, then that will help you quite a bit to pinpoint kind of why particular countries take the positions that they take, right? So, and again, a lot of Scandinavian countries rich in rich in uh, renewable energies from, uh, from water resources or so, um, they obviously have very different kind of takes on, on some of those issues uh, compared to Poland, say, with, with kind of, again, heavy, heavy coal uh, dependence and so forth. Um, and so, I, again, as I think final point to note here is that even though um, we talk about European Union, um, the development status of those countries is also different, right? And that more or less shapes different priorities. Um, and, and I think related to that, there is this issue about kind of what, what's now infamously talked about in terms of this just transition, right? So the questions of how do we, how do we go about making that really a kind of uh, societally sustainable way forward? Um, and how do we ensure as societies and as policymakers that, that we don't necessarily leave people out uh, when we know that in the future transport might become more expensive, it might become more expensive, how we heat our homes and all these kind of things. So you, you want to think as governments and policymakers about strategies to, uh, to hedge against those, those risks in a sense or those inequalities that might otherwise uh, result from, from these type of policies. Great, thank you. And I think, yeah, the point that you made about the, you know, that we talk about sort of EU policy, but we always have to, of course, keep in mind that the EU, of course, now is made up of 27 countries and all of the different, um, the, uh, the, the different um, things that you mentioned uh, that are, that vary across the countries as well, when we think about, um, you know, the, the challenges that uh, policymakers face at the EU level as well. Um, I want to re return to some of the things that you mentioned um, in a bit, but I want to um, now turn to, to Rosemary and talk about the issue of, uh, of migration, which of course is a very salient issue in, in the European context in general, um, and to, to just ask you to talk about that in the context of, of climate change and um, and global governance more generally, and sort of what the role um, of, of, uh, of, of global governance um, can play when we talk about migration as it relates to climate, and how that was addressed at the, at the recent conference parties as well. Right, so uh, thanks very much, Jay, and it's, it is an honor to uh, join this, this uh, group of colleagues to have this conversation. Um, I might just um, switch the language in your um, in your question, just to make a point, and and you know the question might be better phrased as you know global governance on forced displacement due to climate impact and consequences, and so you see I'm avoiding the language of of some of the language that is just fraught right now um, and and highly divisive, um, and and it's a messy, very messy, but a critical intersection 
of climate change and refugee migration governance as it exists today in the multilateral systems and in national systems, because there's no definition for this cohort that are numbering in the multi-millions. The numbers keep getting firmed up better and better by, you know, whether it's the World Bank or UNHCR, et cetera, of this mass movement that is being triggered by climate impact and its consequences. Um, and so at the moment, there's momentum to converge these two lanes. I call them lanes. Some people would call them pipes um, of activists and policymakers and, and even the international institutions who are either experts on climate governance or they're experts on refugee migration global governance, but generally not both. And yet both are needed to address the likely governance gaps um, in the face of this accelerating crisis of displacement. We're going to need both those lanes to come together. And, and the reason it's so hard right now is that there's no consensus on definitions or labels. And, and so the definitions of what is, what is a person who's moving because of feeling forcibly displaced as a result of climate impact, what do we call them? How do we label them? What rights attach to them, et cetera? Um, and, and part of the challenge and is and that the, the global community is grappling with is that the decision to leave, to uproot from home is seldom one, you know, it's, it's personal circumstances and poverty and livelihoods and inequality, criminal violence that, you know, we see play out in, in the Latin American context for sure, food insecurity. And then, you know, there's that personal tolerance for risk. And so in the same circumstances, this household or head of household might choose to leave and another head of household may choose to hunker down for as long as possible. So, you know, the challenge is at what point can we say climate change was the determining factor or the tipping point or the trigger, because it most certainly has a role, but the decision to uproot is, is multidimensional and um, global governance does not like ambiguity and uncertainty, and, and that is our challenge. So the language of climate refugee, which a number of activists and in civil society use, bring, makes it a flashpoint, brings attention to the issue dramatically, but it makes a lot of people very nervous. Um, and sitting in Geneva, that nervousness was palpable. You know, when I was in Geneva a couple of years ago, it, we were negotiating the global compacts on migration and refugees, voluntary compacts, and the challenge and, and the language minutia and debates were, were you know, quite, uh, quite challenging. But the reason too is, is that, you know, for good reason, a refugee is clearly delineated and a defined term in the 1951 Refugee Convention and its protocols. And, and, it, and it extends only to people who have a well-founded fear of being persecuted on grounds relating to race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social grouping or, or political opinion, and are either unable or unwilling, um, owing to fear of persecution, to seek protection from their own countries. So if you think about that, there's, it doesn't seem to have any breadth or scope to embrace uh, forcible displacement due to um, dire climate change consequences. And so people are very nervous though in opening up this definition for negotiation under the 51 convention and its protocols um, in the current geopolitical context because attitudes globally to refugees and migrants migrant movements are is such that you know we could weaken and contract the language rather than strengthen and expand this definition which would in turn endanger the people it was originally intended to protect and so climate change movements are often where national governments are trying hard to protect their populations so you know you think of Kiribati or the Marshall Islands or Fiji um, and so people can go to their governments, even though those governments are resource poor and, and have very few options for them. But it's a, different, uh, it's a different debate than the 51 convention. So all to say though, there's momentum. And I would say increasing sophistication around existing opportunities that are possible. 
even without legislative change or in, in the international fora, through um, international human rights law and, and things are happening in that area and norms, uh, through the broader application of non grifu law, which is a cornerstone of asylum law protection, no turning back people at the border, um, through broader protection um, under the protection mandate of UNHCR, or from even the application of practices from internal displacement, where we have a comfort, a, a better comfort level, I guess I would say, of IDPs, internally displaced persons, um, where an international border is not being crossed, um, that is also being a, a, a major part of displacement due to climate change. So just briefly coming to the climate change side of that intercept, um, there's a clear tension and we see it played out all the time between mitigation and it's what we call the three T's, targets, taxes and technology and Patrick touched on some of those and adaptation and the three R's, repairs, reparations, refugees. And that tension gets played out at every international meeting on climate change um, in general. And at COP26 and at all of the COPs are basically those three groups, those who focus on mitigation efforts. And we saw this again at COP26, the kind of, we can still do this uh, group um, whose focus is on carbon taxes and emissions and innovation investments for uh, green technology. And those who focus on adaptation and who say, um, look, climate change is already destroying um, farms and livelihoods and causing displacement, so let's focus there. And then there's always a third group of what I call the bunch of resistors and obfuscators, uh, but these are fewer and fewer each time a COP is, is held. So at the intersection itself, there's also the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, which have several mitigation strategies, not much on adaptation, um, and they call, however, for data disaggregation based on migratory status. So there's an opportunity there again to build that momentum. But frankly, without a definition of the accelerating phenomena of external climate migration, people moving across borders, it's going to remain really challenging to provide the precision we needed for policymakers on the scale and scope. Um, although, you know, we're seeing fewer caveats and we're increasingly seeing more precise projections, which truly augurs well for evidence-based policy and government governance um, changes and willingness to address some of these gaps. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate the... Um the uh, the explanation of the terminology as well, and I think, of course, is with everything that is that is very very important. I want to pick up on something that you mentioned, and actually um, circle back to uh, to Catherine on this, which is that um, that many of the uh, demonstrations, the language of the demonstrators, the protesters, those that were gathering outside of the official convention venue, um, were focused on obviously the, the broader climate crisis but one of the, the the issues that of course came up was the was the the displacement the forced migration the forced displacement um, of, of individuals that you've mentioned and Catherine I wonder if, if if you could talk a bit about sort of what was going on outside of the cop right what was the role of non-state actors of civil society what were the things that they were pushing um, was this were you know we're, we're seeing more individuals out on the streets than we have in, at previous meetings. Um, the, the media would, of course, lead us to believe that was the case. Um, I haven't looked into the numbers myself, but um, I wonder if you could if you could give us a little bit of a sense of, a sense of those things. Yes, sure. So, well, also reaching back a little, um, back to well, probably Copenhagen in 2009 was a summit which saw, I'm not exactly sure about the total numbers, but in terms of the, the public and the media uptake of the protests. Um, that was similar to really show that the global society cares that yeah, people from all across the world, especially, well, mostly of the participants were from Europe just because it was held in, in Denmark and Copenhagen. Um, but the global society deeply cares about climate change and is trying to put pressure on governments and especially the leaders of governments, which were represented in a similarly high number of about a hundred or so, just like they were at Glasgow. 
The other big conference you could compare it to was Paris in 2015. And there would have been that global movement and global pressure had it not been for the terrorist attacks that happened just shortly before the conference and um, the, well, the including security. So there weren't that many protests possible at that time. And with the lack of global attention to kind of the conferences of the parties and kind of in between in Marrakesh, for example, the year after or the one of the presidency of Fiji, but held at the um, headquarter in, in Bonn in Germany, there's traditionally more kind of attendance by civil society actors in the negotiations and also the ability to essentially well, sometimes are trying to put on little protest actions inside the conference center to to really draw attention to the urgency of the crisis to governments and to really get them to rethink what they're doing often the bigger effect of the pressure is on the global level via the media which is then often also reported by like for the national governments and the kind of national media outlets. So it is kind of filtering back to them. But um, this is something we have certainly seen at COP26 in Glasgow. And well, there are two things that really have changed compared to the previous COPs and taking COVID into account. Um, we had similar, well, there, there were worries that uh, we, a repetition of um, COP15 in Copenhagen might actually be happening with limitations of access to the conference center by those, especially civil society, who would have been inside the conference center negotiations, but just couldn't get in because of physical constraints. And we've seen that with COP26 and a just much lower number, which meant that there was much more pressure outside on the streets. And also the really big change was the Fridays for Future movement and other ac activist movements all over the world who are really demanding climate justice, which is kind of the, the common theme they have united behind, which is also very important to have a, a joint message. And this was really putting a lot of pressure on it. And what we've also seen is, yeah, the local population, which, like in Glasgow, like they, they were really also behind it. And people really started to think about climate change who probably wouldn't have thought about it before. So there really was much of a more of a global attention towards addressing climate change. And this certainly also did help. And also to, to get, yeah, towards those kind of not within the UNFCCC, formal negotiations, but those kind of outside agreements of usually about 100 countries, for example, agreeing to stop deforestation by 2030, which is a major outcome. But that also means that countries actually need to deliver on it. And there's a big question around the accountability mechanisms surrounding those side agreements as well. Great, thank you. No, I think uh, obviously that you know, two important, uh, many important points that you made, but I think two to keep in mind, of course, is the uh, the fact that the that this COP it, it took place in the context of the pandemic, which of course, um, as you as you um, I think importantly point out, those that normally would be in had to be out. Um, and so that uh, that of course changed the dynamic. And I think you know, as you as you mentioned, and as I you know I mentioned in in the introduction as well, that that climate. Uh, climate change and the environment more generally has become a hugely salient topic for uh, for folks, not just in Europe, but around the world, right? And we saw that very much. Um, and it, when we looked at uh, the demonstrators, um, for example, in Glasgow, of course, lots of Europeans, because that's where it was, lots of folks from the UK, but then, you know, lots of individuals from various places around the world, because this is and has increasingly become such a such an important issue. Um, and, and obviously, we're seeing that increasingly, not only in bringing individuals uh, into the streets, so to speak, but also in how, how uh, in vote in results in elections that we're seeing um, uh, Around, around, around the world. Um, I want to um, dip into a question um, that that came up in, in the Q and A, uh, um, and uh, Patrick was nice enough to respond to the individual. Um, 
in, in, uh, in the Q&A, but I think this maybe it's of interest to others. So I wanna give Patrick a, a chance just to, to respond to this. And this is in regards to the comment that you made about um, European uh, leaders seeking to raise renewables from 20 to 40% over the next decade. Um, and if you could talk perhaps a little bit more about exactly what that would entail um, and what that, that would look like, um, that, would be, that would be great. Um, yes, no, absolutely. I mean, as I, as I said, kind of the, the, the language as it stands is, is currently defined in terms of the energy mix. Um, and so I think to, to me, the, the, um, uh, the idea is that kind of renewable resources should, should account for 40% in the energy mix of the European Union by, by 2030. Um, but there comes kind of because there, I mean, there's, there's obviously kind of this, this associated issue around consumption. Um, and I mean, there's this, this other twin target about reductions uh, in uh, or improvements in, in energy efficiency to reduce the consumption of, of, of primary, primary energy use um, by between 36 to 39 percent. So again, kind of, they're, they're kind of they, they try to get it from, from both angles in a sense, kind of to ramp up the capacity uh, on the supply side of, of electricity that's produced by uh, through, through renewables means, but also kind of trying to cut back on the um, on the consumption side uh, in, in, by, by means of improving uh, energy efficiency. Um, but uh, yeah, I think more important than, than really particular numbers, I, I think it's just really trying to understand the scale because the, um, the, the, the previously the European uh, Commission or the Union had this 2020-20 target uh, initially, which meant to, uh, to increase the, the production of renewables by 20%, increase energy efficiency by 20%, um, and uh, reduce carbon emissions by 20% by 2020. So again, kind of this is how policymakers come up with numbers probably. Um, but kind of, so, and, and in order to achieve that goal, which was more or less achieved last year, uh, the, the European Union uh, required about, kind of, they needed about a decade, right? So, so kind of, again, that, that just tells us something about the scale of, of uh, what it would mean, because again, within the next 10 years or kind of nine years, uh, we would have to yet another double the the the, uh, the production of renewables, um, and kind of we, we can talk about some some sectors. Or, but the, the, the implications is it's really a fairly dramatic kind of wrapping up or speeding up of the uh, of the of the effort here. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I'm gonna bring uh, Shanti into the conversation, um, and as, as I do that, um, please, uh, for those in the audience, if you have uh, any questions about anything that's that's come up or things that you're thinking about that are um, related to the topic, um, please uh, do put them in the Q and A. Um, I will not be calling on anyone, so please don't read. read don't raise your hand, but um, do type it into, into, into the Q&A. Um, so Shanti, I wanna um, turn to you and bring you into the conversation and talk a bit about sort of the local connection um, uh, here in Pittsburgh and in Western Pennsylvania to, uh, to the COP in Glasgow and give you a chance to talk a bit about that. Um, okay, so in general, uh, just a quick background about Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania is a natural gas extraction state and a uh, significant amount of our electricity generation comes from natural gas. So I'm going to highlight the uh, aspects of COP that's very directly related to Pennsylvania. So one uh, big agreement that countries made was 100 countries agreed to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. That's huge because methane, as you know, is a very potent greenhouse gas. And this is relevant for Western Pennsylvania because we actually are a producer of natural gas. Um, in April 2021, Congress had reinstated Obama era methane regulations, so which is great, but it only applies to uh, new wells. So with Biden agreeing uh, at the COP to commit to uh, cutting methane emissions, he also has uh, the EPA proposing rules to curb methane emissions. Um, and this time from including old oil and gas wells. So this is going to be much more significant. However, uh, okay, so if it goes through, we're going to see improvements in air quality for communities who live next to these uh, gas wells and oil wells. And only a subset of US states right now have strong methane regulations such as Colorado. For the rest of the states such as Pennsylvania, our methane controls are actually quite minimal. So if the changes do go through, but this all depends on whether regulations would withstand uh, challenges in our um, environment where we have a very strong, um, I would say, anti-regulatory state 
Supreme Court. So that's going to be an issue for us. Um, and uh, I think one thing we've learned from methane regulations in Colorado is that regulation does not necessarily mean increased cost for everybody. And um, increased regulation can actually be um, a way to, um, to encourage competitiveness. So we actually did see companies who were specializing in improving methane capture that gain market share. So I just wanna like highlight Regulations does not necessarily mean increased cost for everybody, and it can actually be a, a source for innovation. Okay, so there are reasons to be optimistic about this regulations going through because it is true that some oil and gas companies actually support methane regulations because it gives them a more even playing field uh, compared to their competitors who might not be capturing methane and therefore kind of free riding on uh, pollution. Uh, another aspect that I wanted to highlight is the, the fact that countries will make pledges um, at COP, but at the end of the day, it's going to be their domestic implementation that matters, right? Um, and for this, relevant to Pennsylvania is that we uh, rely a lot on natural gas for electricity generation, and with prices of natural gas going up this winter, we all are going to face higher natural gas prices. So Biden, by saying that he wants to do a more ambitious NDC and he has, uh, he's supporting climate provisions in our Build Back Better bill. Um, if it passes, it's now awaiting action in the Senate. I will say whether, you know, the, the, whether it's going to go through or not, it's still a question mark. But that provision, if it goes through, it provides $1 trillion in clean energy and climate investments. This would benefit Pennsylvanians because it would help us diversify our energy, our electricity generation and help to make electricity more affordable. So many, many reasons to support climate legislation. Unfortunately, the, uh, although the bill has passed the House, it's waiting action in the Senate. And um, Senator Manchin and Senator um, uh, Sinema are not on board 100% behind Build Back Better bill. Although I think the people that they serve, West Virginians and Arizonans, would definitely benefit from clean energy and affordable energy. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so um, I want to maybe to follow up on that, and thanks for the sort of overview of the connection um, uh, in our local in our local area. Um, so thinking more, um, uh, I guess, specifically at you know what local governments, cities, states, regional governments um, can do to reduce emissions, right? And, and I guess thinking about what we can learn and what cities and local governments can learn from each other on both sides of the Atlantic, right? So obviously kind of what this dialogue looks like um, in, between, in Pittsburgh locally here and what you know, Glasgow, for example, can learn from us. So I think uh, we have to remember that cities have a lot of levers like we have to be optimistic and think about all the levers that cities have. So in both sides of the Atlantic, cities are using procurement of renewable energy so they can, city government can buy renewable energy. So that creates a demand pool for renewable energy. Um, it can purchase um, re, uh, electricity, ca electric cars and so on and so forth, right? So that gives them a lot of uh, levers to pull. But on a... Um, I'm an economist, so there's always on the one hand and on the other hand. But on the other hand, I also want to highlight to uh, your participants that local governments can, own, can be effective only so far as state government allow them to be effective, at least in the United States. And what we have seen in the United States is that during the Trump administrations, many cities and local governments embrace climate action, which would be good for the local economy and for the national economy and for the global climate. So it made lots of uh, economic sense, environmental sense and everything, right? But um, we see what has happened is that although we have this very, very progressive movement in the cities, we have regressive, regressive movement at the state governments where you have fossil fuel having an influence. So for example, concrete example is that cities uh, in the US have been doing uh, have been trying to say that new construction should not have natural gas hookups. So um, 
new construction will rely on electrification for heating and for cooling, sorry, for heating and for cooking. And this is really important because um, buildings are a long-term investment. It would be a long-term legacy if you don't do electrification at start. But what do we see happening in regressive state governments? They have been, um, they have been passing laws in state legislatures that are Republican-led, have been passing laws which prohibit local government from taking this initiative, right? So kind of blocking the autonomy and blocking the self-governance of local governments who can see what is beneficial to them and from blocking them from doing what is beneficial. So I think in terms of lessons for everybody, there are many great things cities can do, but on the other hand, we also have to think that the state, the state uh, component and the federal component are going to be very influential in main, in either enabling cities to go ahead and accelerate or even paralyzing them. Thank you. And I think that's always important to think about sort of the you know, multi-level governance and, and, and the challenges of, uh, you know, again, in the U.S. of thinking about, you know, sort of the federal state relationship or, or and, and what then the parallel of that and not only other federal systems, but in, in other, uh, other systems more generally. Patrick, you want to jump in on this? Um, yeah, I, I really just wanted to wholeheartedly echo what, what Shanti has been saying. And I think um, kind of one, one topic that, that, that Shanti already alluded to uh, is really the, the, the issues around granting planning permission for essentially new builds, uh, retrofitting buildings. And, and kind of you often have this mismatch then that, that, that Shanti has been describing, right? That even if, 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 if mayors or cities want to go ahead with some things, often the planning permission or kind of the planning regulation sits kind of a, at the governance level above them. Um, and that really often very much hamstrings kind of a, a lot of those processes, especially when we look into housing emissions, for instance, uh, but also transport to, to a large extent. Um, and I think on that, there is some provision in the, in the Fit for 55 package of the European Commission, again, where they propose, and I mean, this is large scale, um, industrial like wind farms and these kind of things that the consultation processes are going to be streamlined, uh, that there's kind of a time limit. I think they, they are aiming for about two years in which the planning process should be dealt with and these kind of things just to generate more predictability, obviously in that, in that realm for, for large scale investors. Um, but I think a similar kind of principle or logic travels to uh, especially local communities and, and how can local communities kind of fast track or kind of from a bottom up perspective kind of speed up a lot of these a lot of these processes so even though it might not be the sexiest of topics and the, the, certainly a topic that doesn't get a lot of coverage when we talk about cop these kind of nitty gritty technical details about planning permission and who does what and who can do kind of who authorizes what cities can do and so forth is, is really immensely important great thank you one of um uh, pose a question that is in the chat that is, I think, relevant to this discussion. Um, and whoever uh, would like to respond, just let me know. Um, so the question is the following. Um, what are the wicked problems embedding a just transition to clean and circular economies? Not just the hard to do stuff. What do we, uh, what we do not know the ways yet to answer yet. So how do we, how does this fit into, um, yeah, so this idea of wicked problems and this idea of uh, a just transition and moving to clean and circular economies. So Patrick or Shanti, I think that might kind of follow with a bit with what you've just been talking about. So how do we how do we get there? I think is kind of the the the, the question. Yeah, Shanti. Um, I think there are some improvement, some um, some many reasons to be optimistic on how um, various uh, groups are doing a just transition. So ta um, taking, for example, the state of Colorado, they have actually passed a law which acknowledged the contributions of um, coal communities and natural gas and oil communities to the wealth of the United States and acknowledged that there needs to be a contract between society who have benefited from past, invest, past uh, sacrifices of these energy communities to helping them bridge the energy transition. So this recognition, I think, is something to be, something to be very happy about because you recognize that energy transitions now requires investments from the rest of the community to bring these communities um, with the transition and not leave them behind. Um, 
And even in the state of Pennsylvania, we have legislation pending now, which tries to say that benefits from um, emissions trading, that payoff should go into investment directly in coal and oil and gas communities. And in our infrastructure bill that the House and Senate passed recently, sorry, uh, that was passed recently, we also have money that is directed to coal and oil and gas communities to help them make the transition. I think this is something to be celebrated about. Um, and I kind of want to push back on this wicked problem idea. Like, I wonder whether, you know, if we break down who are the losers and who are the winners, in what cases we need to compensate losers and in what cases we need to um, increase the payments from winners to losers, I think that would be like an easier way to kind of break down the problem. I find like when I think about wicked or difficult problems, it like prohibits me from like seeing the many little pieces that goes in to solving a very big problem, right? So like the big problem is like a mass of, you know, roots behind in a tree. I'm a gardener. So, you know, it's a mass of roots around this tea, tree trunk. But then if you like unpack them slowly and carefully, I think there is a way forward. Thank you, and I appreciate I appreciate the, the analogy. I think that that's I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, so I want to. Um, we have two other questions uh, right now in the Q and A. One I want I'll get back to later in the in the discussion, which is sort of like what next. So we'll hold off on that one. Um, but the the second one was something I was I was going to bring up, and I'll 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 let. Catherine or Patrick, whoever wants to chime in on this one, you can um, just raise your hand, um, which is the relationship between the COP and the European Green Deal um, that we talked a bit about with the 50 for 55 program, um, but just kind of unpacking that a bit more. Uh, Catherine. Thank you. Um, yes, so what we've often seen with the European Commission is that it has been taking global climate leadership. So there, there is really the ambition within the Director General for Climate Action, which is kind of the Ministry for Climate Change, essentially. And they have really a strong history of coming up with, at the time at least, very strong and ambitious proposals, and which are often more ambitious than what the member states at the time are willing to agree to or have even considered vaguely. And with the decision-making process within the European Union, the European Commission is essentially the place where all of the regulations, the pieces of legislation are being proposed and then they're being negotiated and agreed upon in the European Parliament and in the, in the Council, which is where the member states are represented. So there is this very strong history and this really goes back to well, the 90s and I'm kind of again picking it up where most of the European current climate legislation is originating, which is kind of the, the mid and late 2000s. And there, there was also a lot of pressure on the European Union, having taken on this, also the ambition of being leading on addressing climate change, especially after the United States kind of disappeared from the global stage um, with um, moving out or withdrawing from the Kyoto Protocol, which is something that we actually need to keep in mind that with um, the Trump administration pulling out of or not even agreeing to the Paris Agreement that this already happened before. So the European Union has or the European Commission been traditionally in their own, well, in their own um, self perception been the place to propose ambitious legislation. And with the COP15 Copenhagen Climate Change Summit coming up in 2009, that was again the time for them to actually come up with the, Patrick mentioned it earlier, the 2020 targets by 2020 proposals and to really address climate change so that on the global level they can say yes we are acting on climate change and we are being ambitious and to really show to the world that they're essentially walking the talk and not just talking and pushing other countries to, to be ambitious as well. And in 2011-12, the European Commission published a roadmap which already talked about achieving what we're now calling net zero in a slightly more ambitious terminology to reduce emissions by 80 to 95% by 2050. 
And it has almost taken 10 years to actually get there in terms of the legislation also pushing the global commitments around other developed countries and the global north in the wider sense to move towards some form of net zero by 2050. And this is what the European Green Deal is now legislating into the kind of European Union domestic um, aspects. And obviously we've seen, well, slipping um, ambition over time, especially around the major financial, economic, Eurozone crisis, migration crisis, Brexit. Like the European Union has been rather preoccupied with other challenges over the last years as well. But especially the, yeah, the new von der Leyen Commission when they took over, and especially the coinciding timing with the um, Fridays for Future movements that really pushed it back up on the European agenda as well. It has always been there, but it hasn't had the highest priority for a while. And the implementation of the European Green Deal is really what we see mirroring that in terms of legislation. And now also the European countries needing to address that. One note around Brexit, it also meant that um, with, the UP, uh, with the United Kingdom being one of the countries that actually took on more ambitious climate commitments than other countries within the burden sharing agreement inside the European Union meant that other countries which were kind of allowed to reduce emissions less than the European average actually have to step up as well. And there's even more pressure on Germany now to deliver as another net contributor to addressing climate change. And this has also meant for a while that the European Commission had to rethink and we re do the numbers really on how to actually meet those increasingly ambitious targets. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to circle back to um, you know, another issue that is obviously very salient um, in the European context, which is the issue of immigration and of migration more generally. And I want to um, return to, to Rosemary and give, uh, give you a chance to talk a bit about um, how uh, we saw European leaders responding to the issue of uh, using the term climate migrants or forced, forced migrants um, due to climate um, at the COP and, and just kind of how that factored into um, uh, uh, negotiations, um, different things that we were hearing from, from different, different uh, negotiators from different European countries on this. Right. Um, well, COP was, this COP was not very different from other COPs and that there was a very strong focus on climate mitigation so the focus as we've been discussing on emissions, et cetera, and certainly the EU is no exception, but not surprisingly, because the Green Deal um, is about a growth strategy to transition the EU economy to a sustainable economic model. So the goal, and Patrick mentioned it earlier, for the EU to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050 with a Euro $1 trillion in funding to facilitate all of the reforms that are going to be necessary to make that happen um, is what also draw, drives their COP26 and other COP participation. So um, hopefully, and, and, and thankfully, unlike many uh, national plans like this, um, they put in milestones and a cornerstone milestone is a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030, this decade, uh, compared to the 1990 levels and, it, and the 2030 target aligned to the SDGs um, to have a European climate law, which would legislate uh, the 2015 uh, neutrality objective. So they, uh, they're they quite lined up and, and that's a good thing. We can, we can, we can debate is are those the elements that we would want it to line up on because it was very squarely on mitigation, not adaptation, which is where we will get, I believe we'll get that more help, direct help for um, the climate displaced individuals. But, um, but there is a consistency that you can see over years. And so the EU went to COP26 with three objectives to get uh, emission cuts in this decade from others as well. So we can keep 1.5 degrees of warming within reach. And you know it's, it's certainly drifting out of reach. Secondly, they wanted to reach a target of $100 billion every year of climate finance to uh, developing and vulnerable countries 
and they wanted to get agreement on the Paris rule book. And so the European Commission presidents was able to declare success. Um, they got the global methane pledge um, that Shanti mentioned. They got the global forest uh, finance pledge. They got the just energy transition partnership up uh, and they made progress on climate finance. So, you know, on climate finance, there were few details and, um, and few dates, lots of pledging. Um, but also to note, you know, until now, only 25% of climate finance went to adaptation um, where you're going to get climate change displacement. So financing will help, but it, the reallocation of this larger sum, hopefully a much larger sum, um, to adaptation, not just to mitigation, will be important. Um, but you know, uh, in terms of climate displaced individuals, the EU is um, crystal clear and was again crystal clear at COP26 that it will not entertain giving climate migrate, migrants refugee status. They're going to keep a clear lens on instead consistently and in its COP26 strategy and uh, on the root causes of migration. And, and with the Green Deal, they will, they say, and will continue to say that the Green Deal initiative is a, a good initiative and a plan for better climate policies and regional development programs that will reduce the impact of climate change on these vulnerable populations and regions across the world. So this consistency um, is about, you know, they will keep addressing the main root causes of irregular migration to Europe um, and, and, and focus and, and contribute to under the underdevelopment, lack of opportunities, inequality, et cetera, um, that are um, contributors to choices, not choices, decisions on climate movement. So it's hard um, sitting here today to see how the EU will um, initiate any lead, global lead, to embrace migration as a positive and proactive adaptation strategy with its eyes all on mitigation. Um, and yet, I, you know, what we want to have is to see migration as a healthy adaptation strategy, especially for slow onset um, climate change degradation. And that would minimize the effects of um, unplanned forced displacement and its inevitability and consequences and the pathways to Europe. So, you know, we all know and the headlines are clear that, you know, this discussion in Europe is fraught um, and highly divisive across the EU members. Um, it's clear from the border tensions and violence and conflict. So the pressure and momentum um, is building in other parts of the world um, but there's strong breaks on this um, within the EU at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. And just to, to, to follow up a bit on that, are you are we seeing, you know, um, different, we can talk about sort of, as you just did, sort of the, uh, you know, at the EU level, but if we think about, you know, sort of thinking about sort of, you know, different countries, are we seeing that the, that the discourse is, that there is some difference in the discourse on this relationship between, um, that we've talked about between, you know, sort of, you know, forced migration because of climate and differentiating individuals that may be refugees for that reason versus other, other reasons? Um, are we seeing any, you know, sort of the di differences across countries and how that's being approached? Uh, we are, in fact, and, you know, there's some interesting um, pilots and efforts going on um, using labor visas, for example, to get out ahead of climate change in, in small island states that uh, are being uh, used by, for example, New Zealand. Within the African continent, some really um, healthy movements over the last few years in terms of taking regional approaches um, because, you know, one year a country might be a receiving state, a host state, uh, and six months later may be a sending state um, and is always a, trend, uh, a transit state. So good regional cooperation, which is another place to put this um, in the absence of some major multilateral push, which you know, is, would be wishful thinking at this stage. So yes, I think um, contextually people are looking, good leaders and 
particularly as, um, as Catherine said, civil society is leading on this without question. They're leading with data, they're leading with advocacy uh, and really constructive pressure. Um, and so you do see uh, pockets of movement in the face of this um, uh, unbelievable acceleration of displacement. And, and just to say in, in the United States, the Biden administration's um, report that came out a few weeks ago, it took a while longer than what he had asked for back in January, but there's some interesting language in there around climate and displacement. Americans are seeing that at home in terms of, I've forgotten the numbers, but there were about a third of Americans were affected by climate emergencies over a 90 day period last summer. So that, you know, there's good political awareness and pressure growing. And, and there's some interesting language in the Biden report around uh, not embracing a climate refugee type definition, but looking at the other tools and instruments that are already available in the U.S. Um, system to, um, to um, do a screening process to provide some types of entry. So there's, there's quite a bit of momentum for sure. It just hasn't coalesced yet. Thank you. No, I think that's I think that's a, that's an important point that there is diff different types of mo momentum. It's just a matter of it all coalescing in the challenges um, uh, of multilateralism and, and that happening um, are, are are very real. Um, Patrick, I want to come back to 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 you to something that you brought up a couple of times and give you a chance to talk a, a bit more about it, um, which is um, about pledges from different sectors um, as we talk about um, uh, achieving. Uh, reductions in various greenhouse gas emissions um, and to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about about some of that uh, variation that we see yeah no that I mean that's that, that that's great that's that's really close to my heart kind of both I think in terms of um, uh, where I think the journey going in a sense but also where what I'm working on on right now academically so I think that and and um, I think the 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 important hook to hang this all up on ultimately is kind of we are faced with this question of of uh, of implementation, right? And, and as everyone has been saying, we have those pledges on the table, but the question really is kind of what do they mean in practice, right? And, and as a national government, if I commit to a reduction of X amount, at some point I need to sit down at the table and kind of divvy up who is doing what. Um, and, and obviously this who is doing what then comes down to mostly thinking of us in terms of which sectors are going to do what, right? So how many reductions can I get from our automobile industry? How many reductions can I get from housing? How many reductions can I get from construction and so forth, right? Um, and so I think historically, um, I, I feel that, that um, at least looking at the UK and some parts of, of Europe, um, kind of driving down emissions in, in, in power production has been more or less straightforward, again, more successful in some places than in others. Um, but I think what, what the, the kind of struggles I had will be really struggles around um, transportation, heating, building emissions, these kind of things. Um, and, and in my sense is a little bit that, especially for, for liberal democracies, um, if we start thinking about regulating those issues, then one kind of political challenge is that, that it might actually interfere with um, kind of senses of liberty or mobility on, and, 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 and kind of kind of who's the government to tell me that I need to drive an EV car rather than something, right? Or, or kind of, and so I think this is why actually um, liberal democracies, I think will be struggling a little bit with, with kind of making those cuts when we think of, well, how do we transition kind of our societies away from fossil fuel-based transportation to kind of different, more decentralized forms of mobility, for instance. Um, and so, yeah, I feel this is why there will be a lot of cleavages or kind of a lot of, a lot of political conflict coming from how governments go about pitching different sectors against each other, which ultimately will be happening because policymakers at some point will have to have those discussions and say, well, if we mean this transition uh, seriously, then there is just no place for some sectors, right? You can transition some sectors, you can reskill some sectors. Um, but there will be kind of unemployment, there will be uh, kind of, th there will be losers at, 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 at uh, kind of in order when we want to make that transition, right? Um, and so I think, again, that goes down to what I said before, that, that kind of, we will see different responses in different countries because obviously their um, industrial infrastructure and their, their kind of sectoral breakdowns look differently. 
Um, but I think all governments will have to have those those kind of conversations. And, and I think that kind of ties in with, with some of the aspects that we had before um, about the, the, the issues around trust transition, right? And, and again, just to, to put that in the context of the, the European uh, proposals, the interesting thing of this, well, I don't know, maybe it's a straightforward thing, um, but the one claim that's made with this 50, uh, Fit for 55 package, right, is that kind of this transition will be just and kind of socially progressive in a sense, but it will also, it tries to retain the competitive of the European industry, right? And, and so again, how to square this all, I don't necessarily have, have an answer to that, but I think it, it's kind of the right question to ask is how do, we, how do we go about compensating and how do we think about what the sectoral implications are um, because otherwise it's just very abstract to say, well, I'm going to reduce my emissions by 30%, right? What, I mean, what does that even mean? Um, and, and then, so I think again, kind of as, a, as an academic aside here, uh, for everyone working in the space and kind of looking at public opinion and these kind of things, um, oftentimes, even if we tell people how much it costs, this cost is often formulated in terms of, I don't know, increase in average energy prices. And people might respond to these kind of stimuli very differently when you tell them your energy bill goes up by 100 bucks a, a year or so compared to saying, okay, this industry will just not exist in this country any longer, right? Um, and, and so I think, yeah, some kind of having those kind of conversations is, is I think, immensely important. Um, I don't necessarily have the answers to, um, but but I think it's, it's, it's the way I see a lot of the discussions going. And I think the, the just to wrap up the, the pledges along forestation, the, the, the pledges are, uh, around methane, um, the pledges around uh, uh, kind of sustainable green finance and so forth, I think tell us that there will be, we will see more of these kind of sector-based um, pledges and, and some sectors will kind of take on more responsibility and, and, and kind of enter this coalition of the, of the ambitious or the coalition of the billing. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it'll, it'll come down to, to yeah, political incentive, consumer choices to, to some extent uh, where these sectors are going. Well, thank you. And I think, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think it's, it, lots of use, you know, very important points you made. And I think, you know, when we talk a lot about, um, you know, these international conventions and these, you know, the goals and things like that, it's often hard to kind of, I think as not only as 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 those of us who think about this as academics, but just as you know, for sort of the average citizen to sort of really wrap their head around what it means to reduce emissions by X percent, right? That we can talk about all of these, uh, you know, reduce by this percentage. We want to reach net zero, right? All of these kind of lofty goals, but at the end of the day, what does that actually mean for me as a consumer, me as a citizen? And I think that's where you know where this comes down to, and really understanding how is that going to change my the decisions that I'm confronted with my life, uh, my life choices, when it comes to building, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to accessibility, mobility, all of these kinds of things. And so um, we can take all of these very sort of high minded, you know, these these lofty goals. And then at the end of the day, like the implementation and what that actually means, I think is is the conversation, as you said, Patrick, that we, that we need to be having, because that if we're going to get uh, industry on board and citizens on board, that, that's the conversation I think that, that needs to happen um, because that's what is tangible. Whereas, you know, reducing global, you know, global temperatures by 1.5 degrees Celsius, like what is that, you know, that's hard to kind of even understand what that, that actually means uh, for most for most individuals. Um, so I'm mindful of the time and I want to um, get back to a question that was in that that was in the Q&A, but also something um, that, that, that uh, I know um, uh, that, that I posed to, to you all as well, which is kind of to do a bit of a, a, a wrap up across um, all, all of the panelists, which is, and I'm going to give sort of posed a few questions, and you can kind of we'll go around and, and you can take up whichever aspect of this you'd like, um, which is, you know, the, the major outcomes from the COP, we've kind of talked about a few, but if there are others that, 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 that you want to raise, um, and then I think the big question, and this came up in the chat, but I think more generally is what's next? Um, we know that the, the next COP is a year from now, they happen yearly, um, but, but what, what's next in terms of um, a lot of the things that we talked about, right, in terms of reaching some of these goals, in terms of coming back with stiffer, um, uh, you know, with, with uh, 
larger uh, larger goals in the future. Sort of where do we go from here? Um, and then I think that maybe a final question, and again, you can take whichever of these you'd like, is when we talk about obviously climate change, we talk a lot about the climate crisis. We've been, you know, obviously seen a lot of, 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 of things happening in the last years that have led us to, to thinking about this in terms of the crisis and the importance of dealing with um, dealing with these issues in, 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 in the near term. Um, but is there, you know, um, and then obviously when we think about the COP, a lot of discussion about things, shortcomings and things that didn't quite get reached and, and these kinds of things. So, you know, are there positive things that we can kind of take away from, from this, from this uh, most recent COP um, and moving forward on addressing some of these, these issues so that we don't end with, you know, we can end in a positive way a bit <laughs> and, thinking of, and thinking about some of these things. So lots, to, lots, of, lots of angles here and I'll let you all kind of take, 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 take up what, what you'd like to. Um, so Catherine, I'll, uh, I'll start with you. <laughs> On, on all of that. <laughs> Thank you. So, well, taking the, the global perspective again, in a way, um, I think it's important to recognize that the climate change negotiations and the COPs in a way and uh, all the meetings in between, they're at a turning point or in, at a kind of point of transformation for themselves because like up until 2015, it was about getting this globally ambitious agreement that includes all the countries to actually be able to address climate change and they have achieved that with the Paris Agreement. So then the next step was okay we need to get countries to ratify that we really need to get everyone on board with this which they achieved for, for Marrakesh in 2016 and since then the focus was okay how do we actually manage to achieve it in terms of reducing emissions by well below two degrees that's the the official agreement and especially the the influence of indigenous communities of small island states those who are most to lose from and for for those two degrees essentially means that they're going to disappear that really pu is pushing towards the 1.5 degree target which is now kind of entering also the the broader discourse and recognition and getting there is, is very difficult. We're already at 1.2 or so degrees. And this means that time is running out. But what we have seen inside the climate change negotiations is that like most of the formal negotiation aspects around the Paris Agreement are more or less concluded. But now it's really this um, pledge and review aspect of the Paris Agreement. Countries make their own pledges, their nationally determined contributions, their climate policies and legislation essentially. And then there's the pressure from the global community to come together to present what they have done and how they're increasing their ambitions in those five yearly review cycles, which um, COP26 was one of essentially. And now the push is to do actually annually. And this means there's a lot of group pressure, global pressure, public attention on countries to become more ambitious to keep revising their plans, which the European Union and especially the Commission has been doing, and many others as well. So this group pressure means they need to step up and something very important that we have seen, and I think that's also important to recognize is when COP26 started or as, as they were arriving, um, the negotiators, we were still aiming or on the road towards something below two degrees of warming back around, well, moving towards the Paris Agreement, we were looking at a four degree warming. And now we have actually, with all those pledges that have come up, also the, the more voluntary outside the formal negotiations or formal UNFCCC ones, we're actually somewhere close to two degrees, potentially even towards 1.9 degrees. So the pledges and the ambition is actually getting there. And what we now need is that the UNFCCC really becomes this global forum for learning, where countries show what they have achieved, where they also acknowledge where they still need to do more, but especially where they can learn from each other. And it's not about reinventing the wheel, everyone trying to figure it out for themselves, but really learning from each other's successful approaches for domestic regulation, market-based initiatives, um, voluntary agreements, and especially command and control regulation. So it's really about this domestic learning that's well transmitted on the global level. And it's also the global law for learning from the global south, not just the other way around. 
and especially really getting the, the loss and damage aspect, which relates to climate-induced migration, to, to really get the funding to the developing countries who are suffering most from climate change, and to also leverage the financial markets to really increase the investments towards developing countries so that they can actually adapt to climate change and also grow the economies in a just transition way. Great, thank you. Shanti, your thoughts on all of those questions? <laughs> okay, so I think my big takeaway is that we have to remember that we have, each and every one of us continue to have agency and we still can make changes I am not talking about optimism, but I think a commitment to us having agency is really, really important because I think part of the climate misinformation has now warped into this idea, it's too late to do anything, right? So this is very important for your participants and especially young people to remember, okay? Since I'm, uh, um, I wanna highlight the positive things, I will point out that the financial markets actually have moved to greater acknowledgement about the climate crisis, right? And following the money matters a lot, right? So following COP26, we did see, okay, so um, 20 countries and financial institutions um, announced that they will halt all financing for fossil fuel development overseas and divert spending to green energy from 2022. That's great. Okay, there are loopholes because it specifically says overseas, and therefore they can still invest in oil and gas extraction internally. But even then, you see that it's enough of a signal that in November, you had a bunch of banks, asset managers and insurers pledge to um, invest in green as opposed to brown, uh, sorry, as opposed to fossils. We still see pension funds, big investors, and we see um, universities, not Pitt, uh, moving to divest, right? So those are all things worth celebrating. I think there is enough now of a, you know, climate, climate change is real. It's here, we need to do something. And enough of that signal for financial markets to be concerned about them having stranded assets. So that's a big thing to celebrate. On the other hand, I also wanted to acknowledge the conversation we had today because I've learned so much from Rosemary. Like this is not an issue that I've paid so, uh, enough attention to. And it is really, really uh, great that you featured Rosemary and she brought on this issue about forced migration. We have it in the US among our indigenous populations in Alaska. We see it happening. We don't really see much of a, even within forced uh, displacement within the country, we don't see enough of a reaction to it, right? Louisiana, Alaska, um, and also the point that Catherine brought up that you know, the voice of indigenous communities and communities that have been sidelined and marginalized, they're becoming louder and we need to kind of give voice to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Rosemary, that's your cue. <laughs> well, thanks very much. The thing about going third is, you know, you don't want to repeat. Um, I think that there's a I, I'm going to use the language of optimism, Shanti. 